way. And as we move through, I think we'll see um, how that re this really applies. Uh, Kristen, next. So as you can see, there are quite a few of us in the author team. Uh, we represent a bunch of different entities and agencies and tribes throughout the Midwest. Um, so we have Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, 1854 Treaty Authority, Intertribal Council of Michigan, College of Menominee Nation, uh, Forest Service, not represent Superior Chippewa, Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Keweenaw Bay Indian Community, and a few others. Uh, so this really was an interdisciplinary and uh, intertribal effort that lasted two years um, with the goal being really consensus decision making throughout the process. Uh, next. This is part of our author team. Uh, this photograph was taken last September in Minneapolis at the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies meeting where they were presenting the Climate Adaptation Leadership Awards, uh, which our team won in the tribal uh, category. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about uh, effects of climate change on tribes, just kind of as an introduction. Um, go ahead. So the previous slide, and you don't have to go back to it, um, showed something that those of us who work on the Great Lakes are pretty familiar with, and that's um, sewer line erosion uh, caused by high water levels and wind and all of those changes that we're all experiencing. Um, the photographs here are on the Bad River Reservation, and this was in the storm from 2016, which effectively cut the reservation off uh, from the surrounding area. Tribal members were having to be helicopters in, helicoptered into Ashland uh, to go to medical appointments and dialysis and things like that. Um, so we know that in the United States, there are 574 federally recognized tribes, tribal groups, 60 state recognized tribes, and countless uh, tribal communities out there that have been disenfranchised by government policy and action. Each of them have their own climate change story. It's not our story to tell. Uh, our goal is to help them adapt to the changes that are coming. Next. So one of the impacts that we looked at primarily with the Tribal Climate Adaptation Menu is impacts on natural resources. Um, we know that tribes have uh, a different relationship with those uh, culturally important beings, those natural resources, and are looked at as relatives and teachers, as well as being uh, resources. So this slide is from our Glyphwick um, vulnerability assessment, which I can get a link out to everybody if they'd like to see it. Um, and what it represents is uh, these are beings that through a survey of our 11 member tribes were determined to be very important to them culturally and spiritually, economically. Um, and Manuman or wild rice turned out to be uh, the most vulnerable being in our assessment. And it's one that uh, should it be lost in this area due to climate change uh, because the habitat and the conditions will no longer support it would be devastating to Ojibwe people. Next. So just a little bit more about wild rice. Uh, it's vulnerable to climate change in just about any way that a plant can be. Um, it's majorly affected by human land use changes, has limited dispersal ability. Uh, you can read the rest there to yourself. Um, but as you can see, this reliance on uh, our natural resources is particularly important when it comes to tribal communities and climate adaptation. Next. So we know that culturally important beings are moving 
shifting ranges, maybe disappearing due to climate change. But we also know that tribal homelands, reservations, and treaty ceded territories are fixed in place, uh, which means that, you know, historically tribes were able to move and adapt to changing conditions and their ability to do that now is physically and legally limited. We know that loss of access to culturally important beings and the reciprocal relationships that people have had with them over time is an existential threat to culture and community and adaptation actions, um, adaptation actions that are taken by tribes and on behalf of tribes must be culturally appropriate and community supported. And next. And Kristen, you're up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much, Rob, for setting that up. Um, so Rob opened up with talking a little bit about, you know, why approaching climate change adaptation uh, from a tribal perspective is, is so important and some of the challenges that tribes are facing related to climate change. Um, in, in the next couple slides, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the actual structure of the adaptation menu itself and kind of why we chose this whole menu template or menu format um, for thinking about how to help uh, folks adapt to climate change. So first, I just wanted to mention that we, we hope that this tribal adaptation menu will be useful as a standalone resource and just to help people think about um, climate change adaptation uh, kind of on your own or you know, as a brainstorming tool. Um, but the portion I'm gonna talk a little bit more about today is how we envision it being used in an actual adaptation planning process. And um, this is kind of based in, in some of the previous climate change adaptation work that our organization NIAX has done and the way we've approached climate change adaptation and the process of thinking about that. And you can find out more about what that process looks like at uh, forestadaptation.org. Uh, the link is listed below. But I'm gonna talk about the menu as a tool uh, kind of in conjunction with that particular process or a similar type of process. And I think central to understanding why the menu structure is important and how we're approaching adaptation is really this point here, that there's no real single way to adapt to climate change that is universally applicable for a particular problem. Uh, the actual adaptation actions that you choose to implement on the landscape are going to be very dependent on where you're located, on what your values are for that particular landscape, um, what goals you have for that area. And so all of these things are gonna feed into what types of actions you choose to implement. And so starting from that standpoint on climate adaptation, uh, at NIAX, we've traditionally used uh, this bundle of resources that we call forest adaptation resources to help people think about how they might uh, integrate climate change information into their work and select adaptation actions that are right for them. And this process is really designed to be uh, applicable to a wide variety of people, um, wide variety of types of land managers or land stewards and folks who may have very different goals from one another. So this collection of resources is not going to make a recommendation, uh, but it is going to help guide people through a decision making process for selecting their own climate actions. And that's really where the menu, I think, comes into play. A menu is really exactly what it sounds like. It's a list of possible actions that lets people pick and choose from that list, depending on what's right for their conditions or what's relevant for their location and their values. Uh, it, it's sometimes helpful to think of an adaptation menu, kind of how you'd think of a, a normal restaurant menu. Um, they share a couple of characteristics. So first of all, um, you know, when you go into a, a breakfast restaurant, for example, or an Italian restaurant, you expect to see certain types of dishes and certain types of terminology on the menu. And um, adaptation menus are very similar. Uh, we have different terms on say, 
our, our menu focused on wetlands than we do on the menu that's focused on forests. And those both look very different from the menu that's written from uh, the tribal perspective, so from the tribal adaptation menu. Um, each menu is also organized into a little bit of a, a tiered hierarchy, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the menus kind of contain these, these broader strategies and then more specific approaches that are nested within that. So, you know, similar to a restaurant menu where you might be seeing a category of appetizers or soups or whatnot. Uh, and then finally, a, a menu is not meant to be a checklist. You're not meant to go through and select one of everything. Uh, it's really something that is supposed to lay out the breadth of ideas that are available, some of which may actually be opposing to one another. So, you know, in many cases, you're not going to want to pick everything on the menu. You're going to want to pick a couple of things that are right for your situation. So there are a couple reasons that we think the menu structure is beneficial for thinking about climate adaptation. And I'll talk about each one of these reasons in turn over the next couple of slides. First, we feel that the structure of the menu is really helpful in thinking about how to connect your broad ideas about adaptation, your broad um, ideas for what you want to do on the landscape to specific actions. And I'll just give you one example of what that might look like or how that might work. Um, so at the very broadest level, you might have an ecosystem that you really value and you want it to stay relatively similar into the future in spite of potential climate challenges. So at the broadest level, you know you kind of want to resist change. You know you want to keep that ecosystem looking similar to how it is right now. Um, if we're using, for example, the tribal adaptation menu, one of the broad overarching strategies underneath that menu might be to sustain fundamental ecological and cultural functions. A more specific approach within that would be to revitalize and maintain Anishinaabe or cultural use of Ishkode or fire as a stewardship tool on the landscape. So we're getting a little bit more specific about what's the actual practice you might be implementing. And then a tactic within that would get even more specific in terms of describing where on the landscape you might implement a certain action and what specifically you're going to do. So in this case, that might be something like using prescribed burns in marsh habitats to encourage young plant communities. And so you can kind of follow the hierarchy from what you want to do overall on your landscape to the specific action that you're going to implement on the ground. And that can really work both ways. Uh, you might have an idea for an action or a tactic that you feel has worked really well in other areas of your landscape. And you might want to scale up and think a little bit more about, okay, well, how does that, um, how does that relate back to these bigger ideas on climate adaptation? I think similar to the point of connecting broad ideas to specific actions, uh, we hope that the menus really help people make actions that are intentional. So it helps you kind of think about what am I actually trying to accomplish with my adaptation? What is my overall adaptation concept and strategy? And then think about, okay, how do I actually get there? How do I implement an action that will help accomplish that broader intent? And so the menu structure kind of forces you to think really critically about these questions and what we're actually trying to do over the next 50, 100 years on that landscape. Uh, we also think that, that using something like the menu is helpful in communicating ideas about climate adaptation. So at some point, most uh, folks who are involved in managing or caring for a landscape are going to have to explain to other stakeholders or community members or maybe even supervisors what they're trying to do and why. And we feel that you know, going through a process like this and using the menu can really help to articulate uh, some of those thoughts about 
those overarching goals for climate adaptation and then how you're getting there uh, via on the ground adaptation tactics. And then finally, we hope that the adaptation menu is helpful in thinking outside the box in, in really boosting creativity when it comes to climate adaptation actions. Um, I think that you know this is something that we're going to have to to start thinking about more and more creative solutions to some of the persistent problems we're seeing and we hope that the menu can help spark new ideas or maybe things that you haven't really thought of as potential solutions in the past and i know for me just being involved in discussions for creating the tribal adaptation menu um, this was was very very true it really helped me think about climate adaptation in an entirely new way in many situations um, and, and approach it from a different perspective, which I think can be very valuable when we're dealing with some of the big issues and uncertainties that climate change brings. And so with that, I think, Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you and just let me know when you'd like to advance. Sounds good. Um, so now that we've heard about the climate impacts that are happening with tribes and then kind of this overview on how um, these adaptation menus work. Um, I'm going to touch on how the tribal adaptation menu began. Next slide. So um, this is kind of the photo we've been using to show the inception of this tribal adaptation menu. Um, so folks, some folks on our author team um, attended one of the NIAC workshops, um, similar to the ones we put on now for the, the TAM. And when you go to these workshops, you bring a project with you. And so these folks um, brought the project um, with a focus on monomen, uh, which is wild rice. And they were going through the menu and they were using the forested watershed menu um, that NIAC has put together. And um, they realized that there was this need for indigenous perspectives um, when working on climate change, and especially with, um, you know, species or beings that are really culturally important to tribes as well. Next slide. And so, um, a lot of the adaptation menus that have been created already by NIACS have been really reflective of the Western science um, and sort of the resource-centric perspective. And so this need to create a menu that was more reflective of indigenous knowledges and this kin-centric perspective was needed. Um, and so when I say kin-centric, um, when we think about um, species, um, we think about them as our relatives, um, as beings, um, instead of a resource. And so um, this new adaptation menu, um, we really wanted to be rooted in Indigenous ways and decision making, um, and really making sure we engage in Indigenous sciences and knowledges as well. Um, and so this this trend of Eurocentric science looking to indigenous knowledge has been increasing um, over, over time now. Um, and really it's looking back on how we need to be taking care of our relatives um, instead of seeing them as just a resource. Next. So um, Rob mentioned this and um, it was also mentioned in the introduction too. Um, so the primary um, use for the tribal adaptation menu is for indigenous communities, um, like tribal natural resource staff, um, but also non-indigenous partners as well. Um, so folks, you know, in the Forest Service or um, Department of Natural Resources, um, those that are also working with tribes. And this menu is to help bridge communication barriers um, for non-tribal folks and organizations as well, um, and to help incorporate climate adaptation approaches that really hit on the needs and values 
of tribal communities and making sure their values and viewpoints are incorporated. And it's meant to, it was designed to be used across um, a diverse um, range of ecosystems too, um, as well as scales and management goals. Next. And so um, in addition, um, this is kind of the, the first menu. Um, it's based on Ojibwe and the nominee perspective, <laughs> culture, and values. Um, and all that can be seen throughout the menu as well. Um, and just like it being um, able to go across diverse ecosystems, this is also designed to be adaptable for indigenous communities as well. Um, so, since it's mainly based on Ojibwe and Menominee, um, it allows other indigenous communities to incorporate their language and their knowledge, their values and culture into the menu as well. Next. Um, and so, something that's really um, special for this menu is a set of guiding principles that we have at the beginning of the menu. Next slide. And so these guiding principles um, help provide a framework um, to integrate indigenous and traditional knowledges, um, and that includes culture, language, and history into the adaptation planning process. Um, it really hits on things like community engagement um, and this sort of decolonization of scientific research, so doing um, more indigenous science um, and application, um, especially in indigenous communities and co-managed areas like ceded territories. Um, and so just like the menu itself, um, these guiding principles can also be adapted by individual tribal communities um, because they might be different from um, what Ojibwe and Menominee values and cultures are, um, which is really important that it can be adapted. Next slide. And so um, the guiding principles portion of the menu really hits on these four um, areas, which include um, the importance of non-human and human relationships. So like I mentioned before, having it more as a kin-centric viewpoint, seeing these individuals as our relatives instead of resources. Um, it also hits on cultural paradigms, uh, community engagement and decision making, and then also talking about how to end a project and how to disseminate that information. So in working with tribes, really understanding, you know, who owns that information, um, how it's going to be disseminated, what information is sensitive and shouldn't be shared um, outside the project team, things like that. Um, so really talking with your tribal partners and understanding how to go about um, finishing up a project. And then after a project is done, remembering to keep those relationships going. Um, just because a project is done doesn't mean the relationship um, with your tribal partner should be done too. Next slide. Um, so indigenous perspectives call for observation and recognizing and learning from our first teachers, our relatives out there, um, and adaptation that addresses the responsibility and reciprocity to all our relations. So this really hits on the fact that um, in a lot of our teaching, that we were the last beings um, to be put here. And so these, these beings, these relatives of ours, really are our teachers and we should be learning from them. Um, and so instead of kind of this Western perspective of you know, emphasizing control and management of these non-sentient beings, really flipping that on the head um, and observing what this can teach us and what we can learn um, instead of trying to control it all um, into what we want. Um, so really, you know, waiting for systems to naturally establish themselves, seeing what changes might be taking 
may, might be happening on the landscape on its own. Um, so this menu offers that different perspective. Next slide. Um, so I touched on this a little bit, the respect, reciprocity, and relationships. Um, these three R's are really important um, when working with not just tribes, but also, you know, our non-human relatives as well. Um, decisions for the use of our relatives were originally communal decisions, um, so made by the entire community um, with recognition and acknowledgement throughout the process. Um, you know, that includes before harvesting, after harvesting. Um, and today's management um, in general is not that way. It's not a communal decision. It's more based on individual decisions or an institution's decision on what needs to be on the landscape and how it should be done. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over a few strategies and approaches that are in the menu. Um, overall, the menu has over 14 strategies, so I'll let you read that on your own. Um, otherwise, you might be here for a while. Um, and so, uh, next slide. Thanks. Um, so this is just a comparison of the forest adaptation menu and the tribal adaptation menu. Um, so in the forest adaptation menu, there's a strategy um, nine that's facilitating community adjustment um, and a way to do that is to introduce species that are expected to be adapted to future conditions. Um, so that could mean, you know, planting more southern species that might be moving its way up to, you know, our region, things like that. Um, and in the tribal adaptation menu, there's a very similar strategy, and that's strategy 11, which is encouraging community adjustments and transition while also maintaining reciprocity and balance within the community. Um, and so an approach under that is to seek out and share traditional knowledges of potential new beings from tribal communities where those beings are native. So this is really getting to, you know, talking with our, our southern communities um, on species that are there that are expected to move up to see, you know, how, how they act in the community, what they might be used for. Um, and then also not forgetting that our tribal communities north of us as well, um, up into Canada too. Um, so really, you know, not thinking about these political boundaries, um, but working with communities um, as a whole, um, because it is affecting all of us. Next slide. Um, so like I said, this is just a real brief photo of um, an overview of the different strategies and approaches. Um, and I'm gonna to touch on two of them today. Next slide. Um, well, I guess I'm, I'm touching on four, technically. Um, so these are strategies one through three. Um, and these are at the beginning of the menu because we really thought these um, were important to have at the very beginning. Um, so strategy one talks about considering cultural practices and uh, seeking spiritual guidance. So this really gets at community engagement, um, like talking with cultural leaders and elders, um, being mindful in practices of reciprocity, um, holding respect for all of our relations um, and maintaining dynamic relationships in this changing landscape. Um, strategy three also talks about engagement, um, but this is like um, revitalizing traditional relationships and uses of um, beings that might not be used anymore, um, that were traditionally used. Um, supporting language revitalization programs, monitoring programs, youth programs. Um, and then strategy two was actually the last one we uh, wrote in there, but it is really important um, and it's learning through careful and respectful observation. Um, so this kind of concept of doing nothing is doing something. So like I mentioned, learning from the beans and the natural community and how they respond over time instead of jumping in 
trying to fix things, trying to control things, really just taking that step back um, and observing what's going on naturally. Next slide. Um, and then the next one I wanted to touch on with everyone is strategy five. Um, and specifically 5.2, um, that gets pulled out a lot, is um, maintain or improve the ability of communities to balance the effects of non-local beings. Um, and I'm, I'm working on my Ojibwe, um, so um, I don't want to butcher it right now. Um, but this is talking about invasive species, these non-local beings. Um, and you know, we spent um, over the, the two years working on this, everything we put in here was based on a consensus. Um, and so when we were thinking about invasive species, um, it just didn't sit right with us to be thinking about them in that kind of way. Um, when people usually talk about invasive, there's this negative connotation that kind of goes with it. Um, that they're, you know, evil, they're taking over, um, you know, kind of this like war mentality on them. Um, but in reality, these beings are just doing what they were originally told in their original, in their original instructions. Um, the only difference is they were moved. Um, and it's, you know, it's not their fault for, for going according to their original instructions. Um, they just don't have those checks and balances like they do from where they come from. Um, so really understanding these beings um, and maybe what they can tell us and teach us, um, maybe understanding, you know, what we can learn from them for uses. Um, so the bottom picture is um, a picture taken on the Netawasepi Huron tribe um, reservation down in southern Michigan. And this used to be a wild rice bed, and now it has been um, filled with invasive cattails. So really thinking about um, how to manage this area. Do we want it to be restored to wild rice? And if so, um, how do we um, involve ourselves with these invasive cattails? Um, what can we learn from them? You know, instead of just going up ripping them out, chemical applications, that kind of stuff. Um, so this is a really um, different perspective than a lot of um, resource managers have. Um, and it's one that gets brought up a lot. Um, so that's one I wanted to share with you today. Next slide. Um, all right, and I will turn it back over to Rob, I think. Yep, that's me. Uh, so real briefly, we'll just talk quickly about how we're putting the TAM to work. Uh, next slide, Kristen. So one of the ways that, so the TAM's been out for about a year. And one of the ways that we're putting it to work is, has been a series of now five workshops facilitated by our author team, or certain members of it, uh, in various locations. Um, these workshops are typically hosted by um, a tribal community, uh, Tribal Natural Resources Department, and uh, people that sign up are typically either from Tribal Natural Resources Departments or partner agencies uh, that work with them. Next slide. So our full workshops run two to two and a half days. Uh, we found that this time period is actually necessary because when we do the workshops, we do take a really, really deep dive into culture and history and um, particularly for um, non-Indigenous people such as myself, it's kind of a perspective and a paradigm shift that takes some sitting with to get the most out of it. Our workshops are project-based. Uh, they are participatory in nature, so we're not like, unlike today, we're not standing up front talking to people the entire time. They're actually hands-on working with projects that they bring, or they're assigned to a project team. Uh, 
to really go deep dive onto, typically it's a project that agencies or organizations are already working on and they want to uh, address climate change impacts and bring in that indigenous perspective because either they are a tribal agency or they work with tribal agencies. And as I said, we've done five workshops since 2019. Uh, next slide. So our first workshop was in Cloquet, Minnesota. Uh, this is just a sampling of some of the projects that were brought. Uh, the tribal wetland restoration was the first uh, project completed uh, from a plan that was created at one of our workshops uh, by the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma. Um, we can provide a link to a, a uh, synopsis of that project. Um, later on, Kristen can probably do that. Uh, next slide. Our second workshop was in Michigan in Bay Mills. Um, again, some sample projects. And the photograph you see is um, you know, one of the multimedia projects that we have participants do. And this really just spells out the entire process uh, where we first look at the objectives that people have for their project. Uh, apply some challenges and opportunities via climate change, and then brainstorm adaptation tactics uh, from the TAM and from other resources into how we can um, successfully help communities and beings adapt to climate change. Next slide. Third workshop was in New York uh, in Aquasesne. Again, some of the uh, different projects that were brought and uh, some of the ideas and brainstormings that came out of it. Next slide. Fourth in Wisconsin again at Menominee Nation um, and some of the projects. And you can see that projects are starting to become less natural resource focused. Um, and maybe even a little bit more general. So things like creating an indigenous focused uh, master naturalist class uh, and the climate vulnerability study of Apasa Islands uh, is actually creating um, interpretive materials of climate vulnerability in the islands, uh, utilizing scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge. Uh, next slide. In our most recent workshop, which we completed just before um, everybody got locked down because of COVID, um, was held in Red Cliff in Wisconsin. And again, you see some of the different types of projects. Um, also not any more, I guess, excuse me. Um, so yeah, you can see that we're moving out of a strict natural resource focus and into a much more general focus. And next slide. So what's next? How do we help people use the cl tribal climate adaptation menu? Uh, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, we have a fairly small team of people that are facilitating workshops. We all have other jobs and other responsibilities and we're getting actually more calls than we can handle. So we're still trying to figure out how to expand our capacity and some future things that we're looking at. How do we help other indigenous communities with different culture and different values, customize the menu for their own use? How do we respond to workshop requests? What type of workshop is right for the people who are asking for it? And then using the menu as a collaboration and communication tool. And I believe that is the end of our presentation, so we can move into the question phase. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much. Um, we have a couple of questions that were posted in the online. Um, so I can start off with, by asking you those questions that were posted. Um, so the first one is, how is Indigenous science Sabina? different from Indigenous science? Yes? 
Oh, I was just going to say that I've um, we can ask the questions, but I've also um, found out where I can activate the raise your hand function. So that's all oh. activated too. So if people have questions as well, they can raise their hand in the toolbar and I can unmute their phone if they'd like to ask it in person as well. Perfect. Okay, so I think this question was from Gail. Oh, okay, let me go down. Yeah, so if people wanna raise their hands, they can, but I can, um, yep, I will unmute Gail. Um, Okay, Gail. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm uh, slightly confused. Watching the slides, it seems like Western science is portrayed as command and control, where um, indigenous science is much more collaborative. I'm not sure if that's really the distinction that you're trying to get across, because in some of the work that some of my colleagues do, it's very much a collaborative decision-making process. So could you just perhaps get a little bit deeper into the fundamental difference between indigenous and Western science? So I think I can take a first stab at that and maybe Kristen and Sarah can uh, chime in. I, I don't think we're speaking about science particularly, but more like management. Um, and this is primarily directed uh, within the United States at uh, typically state level management, natural resource management decisions, which are driven uh, by typically a top down command and control structure and input from um, fewer stakeholders uh, than sometimes aren't always considered. Yeah, and just to add on to that too, um, in thinking about um, maybe one of the differences between, you know, uh, SEK and TEK, um, so scientific ecological knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge, um, it really gets to um, working with the community and doing things, um, you know, keeping in mind their values and their culture. So there might be, um, you know, a management objective that's really well known, um, maybe at a state level or federal level, um, but maybe it goes against, you know, tribal values and the respect they have for the beings that are being managed. Um, so that's kind of where one of the differences is, is really understanding, you know, if, if it goes against their values, how do we then um, change what we're doing um, on a management side um, and how do we incorporate those values into the management itself. Thank you. That was really helpful. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Um, so we have a hand raised. Um, Karen or yeah, Karen DeMars, did you have a question? <laughs> um, let me see. Oh, nope, you're on. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I raised it before the last presenter talked and he answered it. So thank you so much. But I did want to just have a, a, a are you going to send these slides out? By chance will people have access to these slides after the presentation I believe the session Probably. is being recorded and um, yeah. you know we're we're perfectly happy to have the slides available to people okay wonderful thank you that would be great. So um, if uh, Kristen or Rob or Sarah, if you could send me those, I can turn it into a PDF to send out with the recording when we get all that organized. Sounds good. I'm happy to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Okay.
Um, are there any other questions? You can raise your hand in the toolbar, or if you want to put them in the question bar, we can uh, recognize you. There was a question from Brent as well. I don't know if he's still on the line. I think he is. Let's see. Um, Brent, did you have a question? I've got you unmuted. It looks like he's still on, but uh, he may be away. Hi, Jennifer. I can repeat Brent's question. It was, how might this be useful for non-Indigenous society at the level of broader underlying concepts or more specific actions? Good question. Do any of our panelists have a thought on that? Um, so the menu itself um, is really helpful um, as a, a tool to help bridge communication um, for non-tribal partners and organizations, um, really kind of help shift their paradigm on, you know, how management um, is done um, and how to go about um, working with tribes. Uh, it doesn't cover everything. Um, which, you know, if it did, it would be a very long document <laughs> on um, engaging with tribes and best practices. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know if my, my other fellow collaborators would like to, to talk on that as well. Sarah, this is Kristen. I can just add on to that. I think um, we mentioned a little earlier in the presentation about, you know, the menu kind of helping people think outside of the box, or at least think outside of their kind of traditional management training or, um, you know, management actions that maybe they fall back on or, or do, uh, you know, do repeatedly. Um, and I think, you know, I can see this as a really useful tool, again, for bridging that communication, like Sarah said, but also getting, um, people to think about climate adaptation in maybe a slightly new light. And I think that, you know, one example is just, uh, I feel like a lot of us that are more kind of grew up in the Western management tradition, we kind of are used to thinking about climate change as something we have to respond to right now. And it's very urgent and we need to be making decisions quickly. Um, and I think, you know, this menu, at least for me, provided a lot of, uh, information and instances on kind of the need to to slow down a little bit and gather more information um, and knowledge, even if it it seems like oh we need to be working on this now, you know. Um, so you know I think for me that was kind of a big out of my traditional viewpoint box um, kind of aha moment for a lot of this, and I suspect that there are many other ways that this can be useful um, as a management tool in that respect. And I guess the last piece of that puzzle um, that I'll add in, um, at our last workshop in Redcliffe, uh, the command team from National Park Service for Apostle Islands National Lakeshore uh, specifically wanted to come to that workshop so that they could sit down with the Treaty Natural Resources Department from the Redcliffe Band uh, because they are neighbors and uh, share the same geographical area so that they could incorporate Redcliffe's resource planning into resource planning for the park. And, you know, it's probably the best example I can see to this point of, of facilitating um, adaptation planning and resource planning between tribal and non-tribal entities. Great. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't see anybody's hands up, but if you'd like to ask a question, 
and scanning our list. Hi, Jennifer. So I guess I, yeah, oh, go ahead. Um, I see a comment here from Rachel Presley. Um, she said that she wanted to just say that um, she started using the menu and local hazard mitigation planning uh, for Kawina Bay Indian community. And she just wanted to say thank you so much for creating such a good tool. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And um, there's a question from Peggy Hutchinson. I'm going to unmute her now. Good. All right, Peggy, you're unmuted. Oh, great. Thank you. I wasn't even sure. I I was going to say your help program really helped me get the program. I, I could hear it, but I couldn't see it. But now I can, which is great. I've really enjoyed this. I live just uh, south of Georgian Bay. And um, one of the sessions you'd had mentioned what wild lakes and so on. Who organizes? I'm you know, a part of different groups, but right at the moment, everybody's sort of fallen apart. Uh, who sort of organizes, um, you know, topics? Because uh, there are different ones that I'd be interested in, you know, being able to, you know, meet with different people. Our, our area sort of goes right up to Tobermory. I mean, it's a huge area, and there's all kinds of uh, climate change uh, or, you know, climate issues, but uh, I wouldn't know them and, you know, how to organize a session. You mentioned the one that, is it red? I've, lost that screen now, but um, I don't know whether that's an okay. understandable question or not. Anyway, I just was happy I was able to plug in today to this. Right. I think it is an understandable question um, if you're asking how you could get um, you know, a workshop to your area or uh, how do you could become involved in one. Is, is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So obviously we're kind of on hiatus right now with any kind of in-person workshops. Um, but typically our process, and we've not expanded across the international border into Canada yet with the exception of a couple of presentations. Um, but typically we're contacted by uh, a tribal entity or a tribal or another entity that's a partner with a tribe uh, mm -hmm. to set up a workshop. And then we open up registration to um, more or less anybody that, that's interested in it. Okay, because I, I forwarded this when I got this, I can't remember how many weeks ago, uh, to um, Andrew and uh, Natasha um, uh, Kishik Tobias. No, can't, uh, can't think of her last name. Uh, at um, Oh, near Wyerton, um, it's, oh, can't remember the name of the, their nation, but um, I know them through, you know, different organizations, and she's quite interested, so I don't know whether they've uh, joined in today, um, but I know they are, have a fishing operation up there, and, um, you know, took us out on a tour, and I mean, all these things are things that we share, and it's, you know, there's, there are no, there are there are no um, lines, and um, that's what I say. I like to be able to, you know, be involved, and so I don't know. So I'll just I'll find out whether, um, you know, whether she participated today or not, or whether Andrew did, um, because then they would be able to maybe coordinate with you and host something uh, there. My brain is dead. I can't think of the. <laughs> so, well, there's Sogin, and. Um, but they live on the other side of Tobo, you know, the other side of the peninsula. That's okay. I think we're all suffering from that a little bit. So, uh, <laughs> well, it's, I don't know about you, but I'm in a snowstorm here. So <laughs> it's a blizzard today. All right. Well, thank you, Peggy. Um, we have one. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, we have one last question. Um, we have uh, a question from Kim um, Klopanowski. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute you, Kim. Great. Can you hear me okay? We can. Perfect. I was just wondering, uh, there was a reference to the team capacity being stretched a bit thin, and I was wondering if there's a way to be involved in helping out um, the team, either from a work and or personal um, perspective. Mm -hmm. 
Can you go ahead and spell your full name for us? No. <laughs> 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 um, Rob, yeah. I think maybe you're the best one to take take that. Um, I can take a stab too. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> um, so, so go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Well, um, in terms of uh, capacity, um, right now we are trying to trying to figure out how to expand it. Um, and possibly um, bringing on more facilitators um, to do the workshops. Um, and it's it's just in the beginning stages on how how we want to go about this too, um, because uh, at least what we've found is, um, you know, we have a few folks in mind on who to possibly bring on to help build our capacity. Um, but we also are thinking about, um, you know, possibly have a training program too. Um, so it's all very early stages on thinking about this. Um, Rob, did you want to add anything? Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to discourage anybody uh, from reaching out and being interested in helping, but understand that just as with the creation of the menu, which was a very intentional and deliberative process, our process for expanding our facilitator team needs to be exactly the same. All right. Well, great. Thank you all so much. It's 1233. And uh, I think that was our last question uh, from the hand raise. So, I think with that, I'd like to thank you all for being part of this presentation today. Um, very, very interesting. And um, I'm very glad to hear that, uh, you know, it's kind of that two-edged sword. You want it to be a useful product, but then um, then it can be very popular. <laughs> and so uh, how do you expand beyond uh, uh, where you are is I think always going to be a difficult challenge. Um, so with that, I think we're going to, um, adjourn this meeting and we will make the recording and the slides available um, to everyone afterwards. Um, you'll probably be seeing an email from me, Jennifer Day, uh, with that information as soon as we can pull it all together. And uh, again, we'll have our, I don't know, Shafina or Francis, do you know when our next quarterly call is scheduled for? I'll leave that to Francis to answer. <laughs> I'm not looking at my calendar. <laughs> yeah, she's a keeper of her schedule. Yes, um, I believe it's in um, at the end of June, the third Friday at the end of June. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yes, okay, the third Friday at the end of June. And if anybody is interested in providing a presentation um, that would be fitting for uh, the water quality agreement, Annex 9, uh, please let Francis know and uh, we'll move forward and start planning for our next quarterly call. So, with that, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>